Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So I started making these YouTube videos way back in 2017. And when I got started, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. But this channel recently hit 2.7 million subscribers, which is insane. So thank you if you're a subscriber. And so I thought in this video, we'd break down the three step framework for how to grow, how to succeed on YouTube, in my humble opinion. And basically, it is three levels, level one, level two, and level three. And we work in between those levels and we kind of progress through those levels over time. And the first level is get going. The second level is get good. And the third level is get smart. And then even more excitingly, in between these two levels, we have two choices. We have choice number one, and we have choice number two. And so in this video, we're gonna go through each of the levels, each of the choices, timestamps down below if you wanna skip around. Let's go for it. Alrighty, so let's kick things off with level one, which is to get going. Basically, when you're at level one, your only objective is to just get started. This is where you're breaking that barrier, where you're getting out of your own way, where you're just uploading videos one at a time, and they are going to be really, really bad. They're gonna be awful. Unless you already know how to make good videos, which is coming at level two, you will not know how to talk to a camera. You're gonna hate the sound of yourself on camera. You're gonna hate the sound of your voice. You're gonna think you're completely garbled. You won't be able to speak to the camera. You're gonna think, oh my God, I'm actually okay speaking to people in real life, but all of a sudden, when I turn the camera on, suddenly it's, an, it's just an absolute shit show. What's going on here? And the answer to all this stuff is that literally, there is no way around it. You literally just have to get going. And so the thing that I recommend to all my beginner, part-time YouTuber Academy students, and what I'm recommending in my new Skillshare class, YouTube for Beginners, Etc. Etc. is that you just need to kind of besmirch the blank page and get over that fear of uploading that first video. There's like baby steps here. If you want, you can upload your first video as unlisted so that no one's gonna see it. And it tells you that, oh, uploading a video to YouTube isn't that hard. If you want as well, and you know, one thing I'd recommend is that you literally just get your phone out, you shoot a video being like, hey, I'm starting a YouTube channel, here's why, and you upload it. And if you really want to, you can just leave it as unlisted. You don't even have to publish it because no one is gonna see it. And then what you're gonna realize once you've uploaded a video as unlisted, if you're still one of those people that's a bit scared of putting themselves out there, you'll realize that actually there's not that much difference between unlisted and published. I could just hit publish on the video. And then what you're going to realize is you hit publish on the video and no one cares. No one watches the video because you have no subscribers at this point. No one cares about you. As long as you don't share the link with your friends and family, no one is even going to know that you started a YouTube channel. And this idea is incredibly liberating for people because as all of our students on the YouTuber Academy have found out, the ones who were scared to put themselves out there initially, 99% of the fear is before you hit publish on that first video. And then 99% of the fear completely disappears. It's still a little bit you know, the whole talking to camera stuff, the whole sound of your voice, that gets better over time. But you realize how much effort you were putting into just creating that barrier for yourself and just not allowing yourself to actually start this thing, which involves taking a bit of a risk and putting yourself out there. Now, another question that we get often is like, do you have to make YouTube videos showing your face? Maybe you're a bit shy on camera. Maybe you, you, you think your public speaking skills are not that amazing. And the answer is, you don't really have to. One of my friends, Aaron, runs a YouTube channel called Mr. Who's the Boss, which is now on like 10 million subscribers. He spent his first like three years on YouTube making content where no one saw his face because he was scared he was gonna get bullied at school. But then over time, he got more comfortable there and now he's like the biggest tech YouTuber in Europe and making a ton of money and having a great time and living the dream. Now, at this point in the get going stage, even when someone's uploaded that first video, the next question is gonna be, what the hell do I make videos about? And my answer at this point is that it doesn't really matter. We're gonna worry about that a little bit later, but right now we just need to get going. And so if you're a complete beginner, you know, there's a few video titles that are very easy to do. It's very easy to do a video called, why I'm starting a YouTube channel in 2022. It's very easy to do a video where you talk about a favorite thing of yours. And in fact, this is assignment number one that we give to students in our part-time YouTuber Academy. Like, talk about your favorite thing. In this video, I want to review this fake plant that I got from Ikea that I have on my desk at all times. It's very easy to do that kind of video. It's very easy to do a video where you, for example, talk about what's in my bag, or you talk about your skincare routine, or you talk about your makeup routine, and you don't have to do anything. You can just talk about these things that you already know you are documenting rather than creating. It's pretty hard to create original content, and it feels like a heavy lift. But if all you're thinking about is I'm just going to document stuff and I know my videos are going to suck and they're going to be awful and no one's going to no one's going to watch them. That's OK, because we're still at level one where the objective is just to get going. Now, coming back to our model at the end of level one, you then have a choice to make. And this is choice number one. This is a crucial choice. And when it comes to choice one, you really have three different options. Here are the three options in choice one. Number one is, am I going to break up with YouTube? I have tried this YouTube thing. I've tried putting out a few videos out there. I would say in level one, maybe you make 10 videos, 20 videos, something like that while you're getting going. Your first 20 videos are in level one, the get going stage. These numbers are gonna vary for different people, but that's a pretty reasonable ballpark. I think for me, I got, I made 30 videos in the get going stage before I got to stage number two. And so the question is, you know, you've tried this thing. Do you want to break up with YouTube? That's completely okay. You know, you've tried out this thing as a hobby. You've decided it's not for you. You've realized it's too much of a heavy lift. You've realized you haven't got the time. You've realized your life and kids and job and family is getting in the way. That's totally okay. YouTube is not for everyone, but at least you've tried. 
and now you won't be filled with regrets on your deathbed thinking, oh, I really wish I'd started a YouTube channel 50 years ago in 2022 when it was still a cool thing to do. But okay, let's say you don't wanna break up with YouTube. At that point, there is a choice, and that is a choice of do you wanna be in a casual relationship or do you wanna be in a serious relationship with YouTube? Now, if you're in a casual relationship with YouTube, that's totally fine. That's when you're thinking, you know what? I'm just gonna make videos whenever I feel like it. I'm gonna see you when I feel like it, and we're, and we're gonna have fun together, but we're not, you know, I'm not seriously gonna kind of commit to this. It, like maybe it could go somewhere further down the line, but right now life's a, life's a bit busy. I'm not looking for something serious right now. I'm not able to devote somewhere between five and 10 or 15 hours per week to be seeing, to be doing this YouTube thing seriously. Therefore, we are gonna be in a casual relationship with YouTube. And again, that is also totally fine. And when you're doing YouTube casually, basically you're just not being consistent. You're uploading when you feel like it. You're like, you know, maybe upload a video this week and then maybe three weeks from now and then maybe a month from now. Then you take a break for a few months because life gets in the way and then you upload another video. This is a casual relationship. You cannot expect to get any growth on YouTube when you are just in a casual relationship, just like you can't expect an actual relationship to grow while it is a casual relationship. This is a purely for fun thing, just for funsies. And it's all good. And the mistake we see is people who have not yet committed to YouTube who are expecting some level of growth. Like, oh, in the last six months, I uploaded three videos randomly and they were about random topics and my channel's not growing. Yes, of course your channel's not growing because you've decided you're in a casual relationship with YouTube and you cannot expect any growth when you're in that mode. So that's being in a casual relationship, but you might over time decide you wanna make it more serious or you might immediately decide, you know what, YouTube is the one and I'm willing to turn this into a serious relationship. I'm willing to devote five, 10, 15 hours per week. I'm willing to publish videos consistently. If you then join the serious relationship stage with YouTube, I'm really stretching this analogy. Now you have progressed to the get good stage. So in my book, generally for most people, if you wanna go from get going to get good, and you wanna do this more than just for fun, you wanna do it seriously, you need to make that commitment. And within choice number one, you need to decide, I'm going to commit to YouTube and I'm gonna take it seriously. If you don't wanna take it seriously, it's all good. You don't need to worry about it. But then, you know, we start to get into interesting territories when it comes to level two, which is get good. All right, now we are at get good, which is level two of being a YouTuber. And the objective in level two is to get good at making videos. It's to make our videos better. Again, we cannot expect any growth on YouTube when our videos are absolutely crap, which is what they're gonna be when we're in level one and when we don't yet know how to make videos, unless you are already a professional videographer or a professional filmmaker like Matt Diavello or Peter McKinnon or people like that. For most of us, we are learning filming and editing and cameras and lighting and all my audio and all this stuff. We're learning it from scratch and therefore the objective of level two is to get good. And broadly, there are two ways of getting good. The first one is quantity. And then the second one is quality. And my gambit is gonna be most people should start with quantity. We need to make lots of videos. The more videos we make, the better we are gonna naturally get at making videos. And then the more videos we make and the more we can think of like 1% improvements to those videos over time, the more we're gonna to get to a point where we make actually quality videos. And you might've heard the story, you know, the parable of the pottery class, where there was this guy who's running a pottery class and he split his class into two groups. One group needed to make one pot every day for 30 days, and so they made 30 pots by the end of it. And the other group, the other half of the class, just needed to make one pot over the 30-day period. So at the end of the 30 days, they just made one pot and they put all their efforts into one pot. So that's like, there's like a quantity group and then there was a quality group. And at the end of the 30 days, there was a panel of judges and they decided, they judged where the best, the best pots were. And all of them, all of the best pots came from the quantity group. They, it came from the group that was making 30 pots in 30 days, rather than the group that spent absolutely ages, 30 days on a single pot. None of them had a pot that was any good. And it's basically the same vibe when it comes to YouTube videos. Quantity has a quality all on its own. The more videos you make, and you think about these little marginal improvements over time, the better you get at making videos. There's that really cool graph in Atomic Habits that shows that, you know, 1% improvement over a year, every day, compounds, so like one times 1.01 .01 to the power of 365, and then you get a 37 times improvement. So just by making your videos just a little bit better each time, thinking, you know what, let me try out this new editing trick. Let me try these new titles, these new transitions, this new background music. Let me change the way I approach talking to the camera. Let me try and be a little bit more engaging. Let me use my hands. Let me vary the pitch of my voice. Let me change up the way that I kind of add a joke. Let me add some equipment in the background. Let me drink some water while I'm doing it because it makes me more comfortable filming videos. We're applying these minor modifications over time, but crucially, we're not trying to do them all at once. Each time we make a video, we're just improving something small about the video so that over time, as we make more videos, and I think this video, you know, for me, this was about 50 videos. So it was like 30 videos in Get Going, 50 videos in Get Good. And I think for me, by video number 80, I was able to make good videos. At this point, we've got a few things. So firstly, like, what does it take to make a good video? Like, what does, like, what does good actually mean? And 
you know, there's sort of two ways of thinking about this. Uh, there's the standard stuff. So there's, you know, title, there's thumbnail, there's hook, there's like personality, there's like camera presence, there's editing, there's music, there's sound design. And then there's a bunch of stuff like, what is it? Nine, writing, 10, structure, 11, branding, and a bunch of stuff that I'm probably forgetting. But basically, the, the, again, the message here is that this is not easy stuff. There are whole like university degrees and diploma programs devoted to each of these things. Maybe not titles and thumbnails, but like you can literally get a three year university degree in just being a videographer, in just being a lighting person, in just being an audio engineer, in just being a public speaker. And yet as YouTubers, we have to layer all those things. And this is hard. This is not gonna be an easy thing. It's really fun and it's a really cool skill to improve over time. And getting good at making videos gives you tons and tons of skills that makes you so much more marketable in the job world, but also levels up your own personal skills, gives you the ability to make cool stuff further down the line. But again, this is hard. It takes a large amount of time. And the mistake that we see beginners make, even intermediate YouTubers that are like, is that they, they try and do everything at the same time and they don't recognize that it does take a large amount of quantity generally to get to a point where your videos are high quality. Again, caveat, unless you already know all this stuff and you're already a professional filmmaker. So those are the things that make up what makes like a quote, good video. But then how else do we define what is good in terms of videos? And broadly, there's like an intrinsic version of good and there's an extrinsic version of good. Now the intrinsic version of good is the internal compass that we have on are my videos good? Like I said, it took me about 80, eight zero videos where I was probably on around 2000 subscribers by video number 80. It took me about 80 videos for me to think, you know what, actually my videos are pretty good. And I think the intrinsic one is, is quite important. And you know, the way I think about it is, do your videos pass the cringe test? And the cringe test is that if someone came up to you, like a friend or family member or someone on the street, God forbid, and said, hey, I really liked, you know, I watched one of your videos the other day or, oh, haha, ha, I can't believe you started a YouTube channel. I watched one of your videos. How much would you cringe? If you would cringe at that, it means that your videos are probably not very good. Whereas if you'd feel like, oh, it's not too bad. I don't feel too, too cringy about that. It means your videos have passed the cringe test and now they're at least internally good enough in your mind. And to be honest, like over probably 95% of people who start YouTube, I'm making that number up, but it seem, seems accurate. 95% of people who start YouTube never get to the point where they think internally that their videos are good enough, probably because A, they're not focusing on quantity and they're not, you know, crucially doing that step of 1% improvements over a large period of time to get to quality. But at some point, your videos will pass the cringe test and internally you'll feel proud of the video and you'll think, you know what, this video is actually pretty reasonable. But obviously it's not good enough to just make videos that are good in our own eyes. Ideally, we want them to be good in the audience's eyes as well. This is a bit trickier because this is now where we're setting goals that are outside our own control. So I don't really like thinking about this too hard, but generally we know when our videos are extrinsically good enough, when we start to see our channel and our videos getting a little bit of traction. So what are the things that make for a good video? Really, it's just two things, that people click on them and then people watch them. That's it. That's literally all it takes to make a good video. And that is the million dollar, the billion dollar formula of being a YouTuber. If you can get people to click on your video and you can get people to watch your video, you are absolutely sailing and you would, you would be a billionaire thanks to YouTube. And that is the thing that all YouTubers ultimately are struggling with. How do I get more people to click and how do I get more people to watch? Now, thankfully we do have metrics for this. Click is our thumbnail click through rate, which YouTube analytics tells us. Watch is our kind of watch time and retention. But to be honest, when your channel is small, there's not a lot you can do with the data because you just don't have enough numbers for it to be statistically like relevant and useful data. The other thing you can look at is engagement. So comments. And generally, you'll know when you start sort of getting to the point where your videos are actually good, i.e. useful or interesting or entertaining or inspiring or engaging to someone else. When you start seeing comments that, oh, I really like this video or this video really helped me or wow, that was such a funny video. That was such a, that was so insightful. That was so informative. When you start getting those sorts of comments is when you, again, you, you have this other barometer of, you know, someone else other than me thinks my videos are also good. But to be honest, at this point, I wouldn't really focus too much on the extrinsic metrics. They, they are there and you can spend maybe 5% of your time optimizing the strategy and thinking about titles and thumbnails and market research and stuff. But really, our only, I think for most people, our main objective and certainly my main objective when I started the YouTube channel was get to a point where I'm just making lots of videos, quantity. I'm not thinking too hard about like, what do I make videos about? And like trying to hold myself back. I'm committing to one or two videos per week which worked for me, maybe your schedule will be different, but you do need to commit to some level of consistency because this is a serious relationship, not a casual one. You're doing your 1% improvements and then you're making your videos slightly better over time with all these things, title, thumbnail, hook, personality, camera presence, editing, music, sound design, writing, structure, branding, to get to the point where you, your videos now pass the cringe test and you don't cringe 
really hard anytime someone says, I watched your video, because now you're internally thinking, you know what, this video is actually pretty reasonable. And then what I would suggest, going back to our three part model, at this point, once you have passed the cringe test, at this point, we are now making choice number two. Now this is where it starts to get fun. So fun that I've even switched my color of pen. Choice number two. So while choice number one was casual versus serious relationship or kind of breakup was a third option. Choice number two is the choice between is this a, a hobby or is this a business? Yes, that's the gambit we're gonna go for. So get going level one, get good level two. And before we get to level three, we have choice number two, which in fairness, it's, it's like a spectrum. And it's a spectrum of am I treating YouTube like a hobby or am I treating YouTube like a business? And different people are gonna be at different levels of it. To be honest, I treat YouTube somewhere here. It's like very much on the business end, but it's still a little bit like a hobby because I still wanna have fun with it. But uh, to, be, to be honest, I, I, I treat YouTube like a business. I know a bunch of people who treat YouTube as a hobby and that's totally okay. But when you're treating it like a business, what I mean is that you are trying to make money from it. <laughs> when you're treating it like a hobby, you're trying to have fun. So again, I know this is, this, this is not like a dichotomy, but it's like, what are, you, what are you focusing on? Money or like value to the audience, etc. In a way, treating, treating something like a business means it's sort of focused on others and treating something like a hobby feel, is more like focused on yourself. And again, I'm, I'm not saying you're selfish for having a hobby, you know? I play the guitar as a hobby, I play the piano as a hobby. It's a hobby I do for myself, it's a hobby I do for fun. I'm not treating it like a business. I don't wanna monetize my passion by monetizing the ability to play the guitar. I don't wanna right now release my own songs, I don't wanna do covers, I don't wanna play in a pub, I don't wanna do busking for the sake of money. I wanna do all this stuff for fun because it like fulfills and enriches my life as a person. And if you wanna do YouTube for fun, that's totally fine. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But then you don't really need to worry about level three because level three is about getting smart and is about treating YouTube more like a business. Now, if you treat YouTube like a business, you can still have fun. Like I'm not saying the fun is completely divorced from the business side, but there is a little bit of a danger because when you start making something that you find fun into a business, into work, it actually can sometimes take the fun away from it. Like I really enjoyed making YouTube videos when I was working as a doctor because it was like my escape from that. And even though I was trying to make money from it, it was still fun because I didn't need it to make money. Now these days where my job is making YouTube videos, sometimes, I'll be honest, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I think, oh, I don't wanna make a YouTube video today. Then I get into it and it becomes fun and you know, I've now got a team and we've got the studio, we've got the office, it's quite nice, it's good vibes. And for me, treating it like a business has in fact made it more fun, but it does kind of take a little bit of the joy out of the craft when you have to make money from it. So again, absolutely nothing wrong with treating YouTube like a hobby, but I think we want to be honest with ourselves. Like if you're treating it like a hobby, if I'm treating guitar like a hobby, I wouldn't beat myself up that, oh, I played a song the other day and I wasn't very good. If I'm treating playing, playing the piano or singing like a hobby, I wouldn't beat myself up if I'm like, why haven't I made a million dollars a year from singing yet? I'm treating it like a hobby, it's a hobby. Whereas if I have a business, now I can start to have goals that are a bit more sort of external facing, a bit more thinking about what would an audience actually want and how can I treat this YouTube channel a little bit more like a business. And that is where we get to level three, which is get smart. And this is the level that people are at when they decide that they wanna move a little bit more towards the business end of the spectrum. And if it's a hobby, you don't need to worry about this stuff. But if it's a business, then here are some things that we can start to think about. So let's go back to our basic model, just to, just to make sure we're on the same page. Level one was get going. We started making our videos. For me, this was about 30 videos. Level two is getting good, where we're making a bunch of videos. We're committing to it, doing it consistently because we're in a serious relationship with YouTube and we're improving slowly over time to get to the point where we pass the cringe test. And that's when we know that internally our videos are now good. And now choice number two is, do we wanna treat it like a business or do we wanna treat it like a hobby? And if we wanna treat it as a business, we now go into get smart territory where we can now start thinking, okay, I'm being a creator, I'm having fun, I'm doing this kind of, kind of as a hobby, but I also do wanna take it seriously. I wanna think of it like a business. Now, if you were running a business, let's say you wanted to open up a shop, uh, a supermarket or like a, a, a local corner shop, you wouldn't be able to just be like, you know what? 
I want to I want to sell only the products that I like. I don't want to pander to the audience. I don't care who comes in through the door. I don't care about the demographics of this local area. It should be about me. I should sell the products I want to make. If you're treating things like a business, you're not going to succeed if you don't care about your audience, if you don't care about your market, if you don't care about what people actually want. You can do that as a hobby, which is which is why, you know, we use this thing of like hobbies are focused on yourself and what you want to do. And business is more focused on others and what other people would find useful. So in a way, it's like what I want slash love. And a business is more like what my audience wants. Now again, this is not a dichotomy. Like in an ideal world, we would have this kind of Venn diagram about like things I love and things my audience wants. And preferably also things I can make money from. And then the overlap of this would be our niche, it would be the area that we're making videos. That would be in an ideal world. But this is all the stuff we have to start thinking about when it comes to getting smart. Now, because I'm a fan of frameworks, there are <laughs> three parts to getting smart, again, in my humble opinion. And those three are number one, workflow, number two, cash flow, and number three, outflow. And this is the model for the part time creatorpreneur, which is a, an online course that I'm working on. More details on that in a few weeks, months, whatever. Um, but within workflow, we have strategize and systemize. Within cash flow, we have value and we have products. And within outflow, basically we have hiring and we have management. MX is medical terminology for management. So I'm just gonna stick that there because you know, it doesn't fit on this piece of paper. Now I'm not gonna to focus too much on the cash flow and outflow parts because sort of those parts come later, but let's talk a little bit broadly about workflow. So you're in this getting smart category. You've decided you're at level three of being a YouTuber. You now know at this point how to make good videos, at least internally. And now we've decided we're gonna think of being a YouTuber a little bit more systematically. We're gonna treat it a little bit more like a business and therefore we need to strategize and systemize. And the cool thing here is that there are so many concepts that we can learn from the world of business that we can then apply to our creative side hustle. And those are the concepts that I've sort of learned over the last five years that I've applied to my business and also helped apply to a bunch of creators who've gone through our YouTuber Academy. Again, more details in the video description if you wanna check it out. And this is the stuff that I've gotten from reading books like marketing books, MBA books, like executive leadership books, management books, like culture books, the great CEO within the Millionaire Fast Lane Traction and a bunch of other books that I've read on Kindle or listened to on Audible that we don't have lying around in the studio. Again, I'm not saying you have to do this, I'm not saying YouTuber needs to read business books to become successful, but what I'm saying is that if you decide consciously that you wanna treat your creative side hustle as more of a business, there is a, a nice solid library. You, you can stand on the shoulders of giants and you can figure out what businesses have been figuring out for like decades, if not hundreds of years, and you can apply those to the thing that we're doing here on YouTube. So when it comes to strategize, there are a few different things. There is firstly goals, there's niche, there's target audience. There's competitor analysis. Although we don't think of our competitors as competitors, we think of them as colleagues. There's your competitive advantage. There's planning and there's pivoting. And this is basically the syllabus of our new part-time creative printer course, which is coming up. There'll be a link in the video description if you want to sign up to the mailing list or the waiting list or whatever to get some kind of discount on it, but whatever. Basically, yeah, this is the sort of stuff that we have to start thinking about when we start thinking of our channel as a business, like goals. What are the actual goals? Like, what do you want from this? What does your dream YouTube channel look like three, three years from now? What does it look like one year from now? And you know, there is that, that whole, the, the, there's a really good phrase, which is that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So like probably my goals for the, I mean, my goals for my YouTube channel three years ago were very different to what it currently looks like. But the fact that I was thinking slightly further ahead, that I was planning ahead, I was thinking like, how can I evolve my content over time, recognizing that I'm gonna be sort of aged out of the student market very, very soon once I graduate university a few years ago. Therefore, how can I transition my content strategy to re hopefully remain somewhat relevant over time? All of these are things that I was thinking before as I realized that, you know what, I need to start treating my YouTube channel as a little bit more of a business. We come to the idea of niche and the idea of target audience. This becomes really, really important when we're thinking as a business. And all YouTubers, especially like all, all the YouTubers we've seen in our course, YouTuber Academy, um, basically ask this question of how do I know what my niche is? How do I know what, to, what the hell to actually make videos about? This never gets easy. It's never like abundantly obvious what you should make videos about. You always think, but I'm a multifaceted person and I have all these different interests. Like, can't I just make a personality channel? And yeah, you can. 
But like, you know, we want to be thinking a little bit more systematically about what is our niche? What's our target audience? What are the things that I, I personally like and enjoy? What are the things that I'm personally good at? What are the areas in which I have a potential unfair advantage? And then once I figure that out, what is the kind of audience that I want to target? What are the kind of problems that they're having in their life? And how could I potentially bridge that gap, that bridge of transformation to solve problems for them? Because like we said in, you know, the choice, when you start, if you're thinking like a hobby, it's totally okay to just think about yourself. Like what is the content I want to make? Because it's an artistic expression of myself. But when you start thinking like a business, you want to think, what is the sort of content that my target audience would want? And ideally, we want to balance this with the stuff that we want to make. Because generally, on YouTube, if you follow my channel for a while, you can kind of tell the videos I'm excited about. I'm freaking excited about this video because I freaking love talking about the topic. Versus sometimes we do release videos that I'm not fully excited about. And people can tell, and it's just not nice making videos that you don't like. So again, ideally, we want that Venn diagram overlap of stuff that me and stuff that them. <laughs> them meaning the audience, you know, we want it to overlap as much as we possibly can. Then part of strategy is doing competitor analysis. It's becoming an expert in your space. It's knowing, okay, I want to talk about personal development. Therefore, I'm going to watch hundreds of hours of content from all of the channels in the, in the space that are also doing personal development content. I'm going to figure out how they grew. I'm going to figure out their content strategy. What are they doing well? What are the areas that they can be improving in? What are the interesting areas in which I can possibly stand out? Because as Naval Ravikant famously says, and this is an amazing book, by the way, the of Naval Ravikant. You can escape competition through authenticity. So this isn't about treating our fellow YouTube colleagues as competitors because they're not really. In a way, YouTube is nice because the rising tide lifts all the boats. This is instead about thinking of them as colleagues. But even so, we still want to understand what's going on in the space. Like what is the difference between my channel and Matt Diavella's or my, my channel and Thomas Franks and Nathaniel Drew and Joey Schweitzer and uh, like Elizabeth Phillips and these other people who are in this like productivity type space. And, you know, what are the people who are like adjacent to it as well? You know, people like, you know, podcasts like School of Greatness or Impact Theory or Diary, or Diary of a CEO or The Tim Ferriss Show or Lex Friedman. What are these guys all doing? What are they doing well? And what are the areas in which I can stand out and be a little bit different? Not necessarily trying to be better because I think I'm not a generally a fan of competition and trying to be better than our fellow man, but instead thinking more in terms of how can I be different? How can I kind of apply my own authentic self and create my content, create my channel in a way that just it's slightly different from all these other people out there. Now we can think in terms of competitive advantages. What are the unfair advantages I have that will allow me to potentially stand out in this space? When I started my YouTube channel, my unfair advantage was that I was a Cambridge medical student creating videos for people who wanted to become Cambridge medical students. I did not suddenly decide I want to become, I want to do makeup tutorials. I knew nothing about makeup. I did not decide I wanted to do guitar or singing tutorials. I did not decide I wanted to review tech because I have no unfair advantages in those spaces. And so really, when it comes to growing on YouTube, we need to be honest about like, why like why is our channel gonna stand out? Is the unfair advantage that you've got, is, the is, is, your, is your competitive edge, is your alpha, is your advantage gonna be just the fact that you're putting in way more hours than anyone else? Okay, fair enough. But if there are other kind of levers that you can pull for your own unfair advantages, then that just makes it a lot easier to develop a strategy that like actually tactically helps you grow. Once we're at this point, we also want to start thinking about planning, like, you know, quarterly planning and yearly planning. And this book, Traction by Gina Wickman, is absolutely fantastic for this. When I first discovered this stuff, it was a few years ago when I ran into a business coach who happened to recognize me because he saw my videos. And the first, one of the first things he did with me was we came up with like a quarterly plan. And I'd never done quarterly planning before, but suddenly doing a quarterly plan completely changed the game for my channel because it just, it just gave us a plan. I just never realized, oh shit, you should probably have a plan if you want to take something seriously as a business. And then there's pivoting, which is when you know, how do you know when stuff is failing? How do you know if stuff's not working? Trying out new content ideas, being a bit experimental with some of the content, but ultimately figuring out what direction you want to go based on the data, based on the response, based on how you personally feel about the videos. Once we have figured out our strategy, our next job is to try and systemize. And here, oh, I don't have a physical copy of this. There's an amazing book, a book that completely changed my life when I read it in 2019 called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, which is 100% required reading for anyone who is at level three of their YouTube channel where you already know how to make good videos, but now you want to grow and you want to do it sustainably and you want to have fun along the way. You want to do it systematically and you want to treat it like a business. You've got to read The E-Myth Revisited and a bunch more stuff in systemizing about how to create systems and stuff, how to create leverage, how to kind of refactor, how to sort of figure out your workflow and then like take bits of the workflow and make them a bit more efficient and a bit more fun. And again, this is all the stuff that we're going to go over on the Creative Preneur course. I'm going to be making more videos about it here on this channel. If you don't want to take the course, it's totally fine. Uh, further, like over time. But to be honest, at this level, most people are not at this level. I mean, most people aren't really at level three. You know, for me, it took me 80 to 100 videos before I got to level three. So unless you've made 80 to 100 videos on your channel, this stuff that I'm talking about, some of it is going to be relevant. But at this point, we're starting to get into territory that really 
it, it does take some time to get to the stage where you need to worry about systemizing and hiring and outsourcing and managing a team and all that fun stuff. Let's go back to our model. Level one, I would suggest, or at least for me, the, my first 30 videos were, were all about getting going. And if you're at this stage, you should check out my Skillshare class, which is now out. You can access it for free. There'll be a free access link in the video description if you wanna check it out. It's called YouTube for Beginners. It's about how to just kickstart your channel, how to create the channel, how to get the cover out, how to make thumbnails look good, how to shoot your first video, how to get over the fear of posting, how to get better on camera, how to do thumbnails, how to do titles, how to think about market research. All of the basics around getting started with YouTube, getting going are in the Skillshare class. So you should check that out for completely free. Free link in the video description, you can check it out. Then you need to sign up to a free trial of Skillshare. And then if you want, just between you and me, you can cancel the trial after you watch my class. You don't need to pay for Skillshare. I do anyway, because it's good. They're not even sponsoring this video, but yeah, whatever. You should check out my Skillshare class if that's a thing that you're into and you want to get going. Well, to be honest, like, it's not that hard. You just make videos on YouTube and there's tons of free stuff out there. A, so there are some amazing channels out there that give you great advice about growing your channel, especially in the early days. Then after you've made your first 30 or so videos, at least for me, you know, your next 50 videos are about getting good. And at this point, you might like to sign up to my part-time YouTuber Academy. Um, enrollment will open, uh, we, we run a live cohort three times a year. If you wanna check it out, link in the video description, but that will be kind of relevant there. And if you're in the Getting Smart stage, then Part-Time YouTuber Academy will be relevant for you, but you should also check out my Creatorpreneur course, which is not out at the time of this recording, but it will be linked in the video description or there'll be some kind of sign up to the waiting list or the mailing list and you'll get a discount on it. That is where basically the objective is, once you have a creative side hustle, which is doing well, and you wanna treat it like a business, how do we apply learnings from, at least for me, for my last three years of just like copiously reading a shit ton of business books, how do we apply all of those to our creative side hustle to make it more like a business while hopefully having fun along the way and keeping things sustainable. All right, so hopefully this was all helpful. Bit of a whistle stop tour through all of the things. If you are at that beginner stage or even if you're at the intermediate or advanced stage and you want more tips for YouTube, check out this video over here, which is my top 10 tips for aspiring or beginner YouTubers. And you might like to check out my Skillshare class. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been a semi useful video. If you're in this YouTube thing, it's a bit niche. If you're not and you still watched it, then thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving, you the, giving me the watch time and the engagement and stuff on YouTube, but probably wasn't relevant to you unless you actually want to be a YouTuber. But yeah, thank you so much for Watching, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye. And if you're still watching this and you want a ton more tips and tricks from me and my team on how to grow on YouTube, we actually have a brand new channel called the Part-Time Creator Academy where we create videos completely for free here on YouTube about how to grow a sustainable creator business part-time so that you can like do this creator thing in a nice way. Anyway, if you want to check that, click over there or hit the link in the video description that'll be linked to a part-time Creator Academy YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully this was useful. Do hit the subscribe button and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.